Most of my years in schooling were actually um, good, great memories. But like all of us, I had some low points. Uh, one of them was when I was in seminary. Uh, I lost it on a secretary on a phone call. Uh, she had made some decisions that cost me money that I didn't have, and so I kind of blew up at her. Her boss happened to be on the other end uh, listening, and when she hung up, she was crying. And so he reported me, and next thing I was sitting at the dean's office, and he was asking me, well, why did you decide to act the way you did? I mean, even if she was wrong, why did you choose that way to deal with it? You know, I really didn't have a good answer. I was like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why I blew up. Uh, I guess you could say pressure and stress and all that, but why I chose that, I don't know. I suppose it's the same reason that uh, somebody blows up at a cashier at a drive through because they didn't get their order right, or a woman chooses to flirt with a man who's already married, or why people spend money that, when they know they don't really have it, or someone talks about other people behind their back, or people look at stuff on screens they know they shouldn't look at, but they do anyway, and you ask them why and they don't really know. Well, that reason why we don't know is what I want to talk about today as we're doing this series, The Big Picture. We learned in our first, very first sermon last week that God has this huge plan that he's been working throughout the epoch and ages and millennia of time. But today I want to go right back to the book of Genesis and I want to find out why God needs a plan because we'll never really understand the plan until we understand why he decided he needed a plan. So as you take out your Bible, um, you may have uh, one online uh, or you may have a paper one, but you know, uh, we are now with version, and having a daily time in the scriptures is the most challenging and renewing thing that we can do as Christians. So I would really encourage you to join us on the version, and you can put notes there. You can, uh, you can, there's questions that you can do through the week that follow the same sermon that I'm working on. But Genesis chapter one and verse one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, created everything. Now earth was formless and it was empty and it was darkness over the surface of the deep and the, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. He spoke and things came into being. God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. So there's two things that come out in the first chapter of Genesis that are said over and over. One is God said, when he speaks, everything he's thinking and wants comes into being. So God uh, has a desire, he has a vision for what he wants this earth to be. And he speaks it into existence. And it also says, not only God said, but it also says, and God saw that it was good. Now good implies that it fulfills a purpose of some sort. So what was the purpose God had for this earth? Well, his heart, the heart of God and the love of God desired to have a family, really is the easiest way to say it. He wanted people, sentient beings that could choose to love him and with whom he could be in relationship with. That's the nature of the love of God. It's always outward, it's always towards something. And so God created a family that he could love and he created man and he created woman and he put them in the garden. It was like God was acting like a, a, a pregnant mom that is ready to deliver. And, and she goes and she, she chooses a room to be a nursery and she paints it just the right color. And she puts just the right furniture, the right chair and the right dress chest of drawers and the right change table and the right carpet and, and the right stuffy animals. And everything is perfect and ready for the coming of the baby. And that's what God was like. He was like a, a pregnant mom preparing a nursery, only he did it on a much grander scale. He created a whole world for his creation and what he envisioned would be a, a race of people with whom he would have a relationship with. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and he said to them, hey, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So notice there were two things that God gave as responsibilities 
uh, tasks, tasks is the wrong word, responsibilities, because they were life-giving. One, they were to multiply, so they were to reproduce. And number two, they were to rule over and take care of the earth. So that was work. So work and reproduction were the two responsibilities they had to subdue the earth and to multiply and fill it. Now we don't really know how long they lived in the garden with God. We know that they walked with God in the cool of the day, that that was a, a discipline of, of being in the presence of God that they have. But we don't really know how long they were there. We just know that they were in a perfect place and perfect harmony between them and God and between each other. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree of the garden? The woman responded to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Two things here. Uh, the first thing is that uh, Eve knew what God had said. She repeats it. She said, God told us, don't eat the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. She totally understood the command of God. She wasn't ignorant. She wasn't, it wasn't unknown to her. She knew what God expected of her. The second thing is that Satan does what Satan does and what he always does, he lies and he, and he plants seeds of doubt in Eve. Surely you're not going to die. Well, God said, Eve said, God said I would die if I did this, but he planted the doubt in there. And then he plants that, well, you know why God doesn't want you to do this is because then you'll be like God. You're, he's holding out on you. And so this is the test that Adam and Eve face. Adam's not mentioned yet in the text, but he's right there. And here's the test. Will you trust God or distrust God? Will you believe God's word to be truth? Or will you believe God is holding out on you? Will you submit to God and his authority in your life or will you reject that and rebel? Will you choose your way or will you choose God's way? Now that's not unusual, that's still happening today. Satan's still whispering in the lives of people that are around, uh, that are in our world today. He says things like, surely when people die they won't go to hell. Or surely God can't expect you to be sexually pure. I mean, everybody has sex today. You don't have to be married. Surely God didn't mean that I shouldn't date that person just because they're not a believer. They're so good, they're so nice. They're even better than most Christians I know. Surely there are more ways to heaven than just through Jesus. Surely God didn't mean that. Surely God doesn't mean that I should forgive somebody who's hurt me so much. You know, all these things that I just said really are reflected in our lives, in how you responded last week. Thank you so much for so many of you sending in the texts and telling us things that will prevent you from joining God in his mission. And they're the things that Satan whispers into our lives. Things like rebellion. Well, that started by Satan as he whispers in, don't follow God, don't do the things that God wants, or apathy. There's better things to spend your time on than the things that God wants you to. Or past hurts that aren't forgiven. Or disappointments and a rebellion. All those things that you sent in, all those things that are obstacles are usually the result of Satan whispering to us to doubt God and to distrust God and choose not to obey God. Because that's the same choice that Adam and Eve had and uh, they have to make a choice. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So Eve and Adam make their choice. They choose self instead of God. They choose to distrust God and trust Satan. They choose to neglect to obey, but rather to rebel. And in so doing, they plunge mankind and all of creation 
into chaos and pain and turmoil. Another name we use is sin. Instead of choosing to obey God, they choose instead what brings death. You know, a lot of us uh, face the same thing today. We have to choose to face and trust God or trust ourselves or trust Satan, trust the lies that we believe. It's funny in our relationships, our marriages, and what we watch on the screens, how we deal with people at work, the principles that we use. We tend to distrust God's word and his principles, principles to be honest, to forgive, principles like trusting a God and being godly in our sexual lives, giving our money. Those kinds of things are commands and teachings and truth that God gives, but we choose rather to trust our own gut, to trust what Satan has bred into this world. And as a result, we bring pain and difficulty into our lives. So the result from Adam and Eve's decision come fivefold. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God. But the Lord God called the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. You know, the first consequence of sin is flight. Adam and Eve, for the first time in their lives, feel fear and shame and guilt, things they've never felt before. And they look at each other and realize that they're naked. And so they hear God and run from Him. Flight, they're running from God. You know, in our lives, when we have failed God, we often run from Him. We make up excuse, we justify ourselves, we leave physically, leave places, leave families, leave areas, leave work, because we don't want to face the reality of what we have done. And I just want to say to those of you that may be running from God, you will never find peace. Fear and shame and guilt will always hound you until you're ready and willing to run back to God Lay out your sin before him and say, God, this is true of me. Now, what do I have to do to make this right with you and everybody that I've hurt? Because one of the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin was flight, running from God. But there's four more that happen. So we see in scripture, and God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, well, the woman you put me here with, well, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it you have done? And the woman said, well, the serpent, de serpent deceived me and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman between her off, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And to the woman he said, I will make your pains and childbearing very severe and, will, and with painful labor you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. The second consequence of sin and their decision was to fight. First it was flight from God, now it's to fight with one another. It's very interesting how quickly Adam turns on Eve. Well, it was her fault. The woman you gave me, she made me eat it. And then uh, Eve turns on the serpent, uh, well, the one that she had just trusted and believed. Oh, well, him, he was the one that deceived me. And so then you see God saying to the serpent that I am going to put enmity, battles, and fighting between you and the seed of the woman. So, so because Adam and Eve allowed Satan into the garden, and by the way, Satan wasn't put there by God. He was allowed to come in under the authority of Adam and Eve, and they listened to him and gave him place. And so because of the deception, there's going to be demonic warfare between man and demons for the entirety of man's existence. Then there's going to be conflict 
between a husband and his wife. I think most of us that are married can bear that out. Then there's going to be conflict between brothers and families and organizations and even nations. In fact, the very next story in the scripture after this chapter is the story of Cain and Abel, Cain killing his own brother Abel, violence and conflict exploding. In fact, in a few chapters later, God will have to, because the violence of mankind has become so severe, God is going to have to bring an end to mankind on the earth through the flood. Violence and conflict, fighting, are one of the flaws or one of the consequences of the fall and for the decision that Adam and Eve made to disobey God. And yet again, that's two, flight, fight, there's more. So it's interesting when you stop and look at some of the specifics of the judgment that God had for the uh, man and woman, to the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to your children. And then to Adam, he says, uh, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit of the tree about which I've commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. What I find interesting about this is that, do you remember those two major responsibilities that God gave man to rule over the world, take care of it, that was his work, and then to multiply and fill it, and that was reproduction, work and reproduction. That's where the curse touches. The two things that they were responsible to do and failed to do now bear consequences in their life. And isn't that how often when we fail to do what we're supposed to do, it brings consequences into our life. And here, uh, we see the flaw that those two things are now flawed. Uh, work will have painful toil and sweat of the brow and you're going to work hard to produce what the world would have normally produced easily for you, you're going to work hard for. And so work will now be mixed with pain. And uh, bearing children, uh, your Eve, you and, and your descendants, women, will have very severe pain in childbirth. Uh, just think of mostly through the world. We're fortunate for our medical care. Many, many women and children died in childbirth. It was so, so severe through the thousands of years of history that we have been in. And so we see that, that the consequences is that the two responsibilities that were supposed to be life-giving are now flawed. But that doesn't mean there's something wrong with either one of those two. God gave man work and reproduction before sin ever entered. They're good things. In fact, even today in our work and in our raising, having children and raising them, we bring honor and glory to God when we do them for him in his name, in his way. And so your work, even when you struggle with it, even when you hate going to work, is a place that you can give honor and glory to God by doing it with an attitude and with a heart that honors him. And same with raising our children. I mean, it's difficult to raise children. It's hard, it's challenging. And we come sometimes get disappointed, but our families, when they're centered on God, give honor and glory to God. But because of our sin and because of the sin of Adam and Eve, our work and our reproduction will be filled with pain. So they're now flawed. So as you look a little bit closer into what God said to Adam, he said, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Clearly a reference to death. And then down in verse 22, and the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us. He now knows good and evil. And look at the impact it's having on him. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Death, fatality, now comes to the existence of mankind. See, death, we, we often think of death as a distinction, or extinction rather, because we're on this side, and when somebody dies, they leave us, and we think they no longer exist here. But that's not at all what death is, because life doesn't end at the grave. The grave is a doorway into our next uh, phase of life or existence. 
And death is really separation. It means to be separated from somebody else. And when somebody dies, they leave here and they're separated from us and we feel the weight of that. But what we need to understand is that we, be, because of sin, have been separated from God. And so that means that uh, his, his, he's the source of life. And so all that he gives, all the life that he gives, we no longer have access to. We've become like that proverbial coal that is, falls away from the fire and then slowly and gradually it begins to cool off and, and the fire goes down and the light goes out and it gets cold until eventually it goes out, it dies. And we're like that, we, we've been moved from the fire of God's presence. And what happens to us is that gradually we begin to cool off and the light of life goes out of us until we become cold and die. You see that God is the, the very source of love and hope and happiness and joy and peace, light and, and uh, the things that we long for in life, meaning and fulfillment and purpose. It's all tied up in God and when we're separated from him, we're removed from them, the life flows out of us. And so now along with the flight running from God and fight conflict with one another and being flawed in our most basic responsibilities comes fatality, comes death. And yet there's still one more. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove man out, he placed on the east side of Garden Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. We become the foes of God. We become enemies of God. You may not feel like an enemy of God, but that's how God views us because we have rebelled and we have turned away from God. And the consequence of that is we become the foes of God, banished from the presence of God, banished from knowing God, banished from the very relationship that is central to our existence and why we were created. And so the result of Adam and Eve's sin were to bring five deadly consequences that still haunt us to this very day. You know, this is a uh, very negative and dark view of mankind. A lot of the reasons why people don't like to hear it. Uh, but it's the truth about who we are. And yet, in the middle of all this uh, catastrophe and consequences and uh, condemnation that comes from God, there's a, a ray of hope. Uh, there's a freshness, like, like in this darkness of a forest, you can hear the bubbling of water that goes through, that life comes bubbling through this passage. When in verse 15, God says uh, to the, interestingly says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. This offspring that God is referring to will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Already, even at the very start, God has a plan. And he has a plan because man has sinned and has is fleeing from God and is fighting with one another and has ruined the responsibilities that God has given to him and has brought death to himself and banishment and has become a foe with God. Even in the midst of all that darkness, God has a plan. And we needed him to have a plan because his choices are to throw us out or to rescue us. And even in the midst of bringing our consequences and our judgment, he chooses to rescue us. So I got two questions I want to end with. The first one is, have you chosen to receive the plan that God has for you? I don't know if you realize it, but God has been working in this world, but he's also been working in your life. And that he has been working to bring you to a point that you understand the plan that he has for you, that your redemption and your rescue is in one person, Jesus. In fact, in the New Testament, we're told that there's no other name under heaven, no one else that can reconcile with God, us with God except for Jesus. And that's because Jesus was the infinite, perfect God-man who took our sin to the cross, 
pay the cost of our sin so that we could re have restored relationship with God. And only through him can we find this reconciliation and rescue with God. So my question for you is, have you experienced God? Have you been restored to him? Have you had your sins forgiven? If you want to, it's very simple. It's just to put faith in God. And what do I mean by that? Putting faith in God means to admit you're a sinner, that yeah, God, what you say about me is true. To uh, then believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is sufficient to make you right with God, that it covers your sin. And then for you to choose to surrender your life and to follow God. So that's the first decision that needs to be made. You get to choose to submit to God or to go your own way. You get to choose to surrender or to chart your own path. You get to choose to have life or to have death. The second thing I would say is if you have made that choice and you say, oh no, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I, I've made that choice. I believed in Jesus. I put my faith in him. My question for you is, is have you joined with him? I mean, of all the things God writes about in scripture, this plan to restore and redeem mankind is the thing that's on his heart. He created us to have a relationship with us. It's been broken. He wants it back. And he, that's the thing he's doing most in scripture. But are you joining with him? You see, that's why we're talking about my four all the time. I don't know if you're familiar with it. My four is to ask God for at least four people in your life who don't know Jesus as their savior and ask God to use you to reach them, to help them take a step toward God, whatever that step is. Maybe even step into a relationship with God, but, but to be part of what God is doing in their life to reach them. But you have to be willing to ask God for your four and then invest love into their lives and invite them into conversations or to read stuff or to watch stuff online like this, that they can learn about what God wants and has for them. So my question for you is, do you have your my four? Why not? If you don't, why not? So as we end today, we're seeing the reason why there needed to be a plan. Because we needed it. Because we broke our relationship with God. And without his plan, we can never be restored. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at how that plan works itself out throughout the history of mankind as revealed in scripture.